The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Directions Magazine geospatial webinar. Today, our sponsor is Penn State, and this is our eighth webinar in our series with Penn State. Today's focus is on remote sensing. It's not just for the remote sensing specialist anymore. As you can see, we have a very distinguished panel today, and we'll introduce you to everyone in just a minute. You can check out our current offerings of webinars on our homepage under the Webinars tab. Next week we have two webinars. The one with the OGC on the Sensor Web Enablement Standards, I definitely commend that one to you as it will cover some very interesting and important quality of life case studies. Two related to air quality, one in Saxony, Germany and another one in Durban, South Africa. And another one that addresses uh, cholera in Uganda, so it's very interesting webinar that we have next Tuesday. We very much appreciate your time today and we're going to honor our commitment to you by finishing within the hour. So let's go ahead and get started. So today we have a global audience with more than 500 people registered for this topic. As you can see, we've got people um, joining from every corner of the globe. We mapped people today based on their response to one of our registration questions. Are you seeing a greater need to know about remote sensing in your job or organization? And as you can see, those blue dots, most, many people indicated that they do need to have more information now or they will need to soon um, or even we have a few people signed up today um, to see if they can enhance their skill set for potentially looking for a new job. So you're definitely in the right place today. And in speaking of enhanced skill sets, I do want to let everyone know that participation in our web webinar series does count towards the GISCI's EDU3 points. So if you need a certificate of participation um, for today's webinar, please email me. My email will be in the thank you note you receive, and that's probably going to be going out tomorrow. So um, let's take a few a look at a few housekeeping tips. And I see somebody who says there's no pin for me in Puerto Rico. Sorry, we must have missed you. There were a few that few people that couldn't be geocoded. Or actually, I made the map yesterday, so maybe you registered after that. My apologies to Puerto Rico. Anyway, so let's get to these first housekeeping details. During today's presentation, we will be taking a few polls and we'll walk you through that process when we get to you. There's going to be three polls. We also encourage asking questions. In your control panel, there is a section called questions and click on that plus sign and you can type in your question. You can do this at any time during the webinar and we'll respond to as many of them during the Q&A at the end of the webinar as we possibly can. If you have any technical difficulties, you can use that same interface you use to ask questions to send us a message and I'll try to help you out. Um, you can also send us a tweet at Directions Mag and include the hashtag um, pound Penn State. And of course, the number one question we get during webinars is whether the webinar is being recorded. Yes, today's webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive an email with instructions on how to view that on demand. And like I said before, we should get that email out to you tomorrow morning. You can also access a PDF copy of our slides and you can take a look at the biographies, brief biographies of our speakers and those two URLs are in your chat window now so you can check those out. Finally, there will be a quick survey as you leave the webinar and we'd appreciate it if you take a, a minute to just let us know how we did today. So let me just tell you everything a little bit about Directions Magazine in case you don't know um, everything that we do. We're best known for our comprehensive online publication, Directions Magazine, and our newsletter and the many resources we offer to geospatial professionals. We also offer our content organized into channels. These are our online resources with news, articles, videos, podcasts, etc., etc., for professionals in various um, industries and, um, and technology areas that are encompassed within geospatial and they're a helpful way to navigate our copious content to drill into your specific area of interest. You'll find them on our homepage and I've put the URL for our remote sensing channel on the screen here so that might be of interest to some of you on today's webinar. And we have blogs and we also host webinars almost every week. So now I would like to introduce to you our um, series um, moderator, Wes Stroh. And this is Wes and my uh, eighth webinar 
together, so we are old pals now. Um, Wes is a lead author and instructor for a new course at Penn State, Location Intelligence for Business, and he's an instructor and co-author of an introductory course called The Nature of Geographic Information. Prior to joining up this GIS world and geography, Wes worked in technical sales and marketing at AT&T and Exo Communications, and he was also in product management and merchandising planning with May Department Stores coach and Eddie Bauer. His research interests include marketing and business strategy applications of GIS, and he holds an MS in Geography from Penn State and a graduate certificate in Network Design and Analysis from the University of Denver. So, Wes, I'd love to um, uh, join, ask you to join in now and take it away. Thanks, Nora, and I'm excited to be here as well for our eighth in the series, Inside Geospatial Education and, and Research, and we're thrilled to be bringing you this remote sensing webinars. We've just recently expanded our remote sensing curriculum. We'll, we'll get to that in just a minute, but we'd like to start out with our first poll. And our first poll is going to ask the audience to think about this question. Which aspects of remote sensing do you regularly encounter in your workplace? You can choose more than one. So Nora, let's go ahead and turn that poll on. So in terms of what you encounter in your workplace in the context of remote sensing, do you encounter orthophotos, elevation and terrain data, do you do image analysis? Something else we haven't listed? Or are you one of those folks who doesn't feel like they really encounter remotely sensed data yet? Go ahead and take a minute. Go ahead and let us know what you think. Nora, are you seeing those polls coming in? I sure am. Thanks for checking on that. We've got, uh, gosh, uh, quite a lot of people participating in this poll. And I apologize. It looks like I truncated a couple of words there um, on the question itself, but it looks like it's making sense to people. And it looks like the, the voting is leveling off. We have um, about 85% of the audience has um, voted. So I'm going to go ahead and close that and share the results. Thanks. Okay, so definitely orthophotos is, um, is up there. Two-thirds of the audience um, is dealing with that, but also almost 60% of you are dealing with elevation and terrain data. 50% of you are um, uh, seeing image analysis coming up. Um, some other things are also um, showing up for you. And then um, there's, there's just a few of you who aren't uh, encountering remotely sensed data regularly yet. But, you know, most of you are, so you're definitely in the right place, and I do see questions already coming in from the audience, so um, looks like uh, we've got a, a, a good bunch of interest in this crowd, Wes. Let's go ahead and turn to our agenda today, Nora. Uh, I, I think that that poll question really does set us up for the, the kind of context of what we're going to try to cover today. What we really want to think about today, uh, and if you think back to our title, uh, it's not just for the remote sensing specialist anymore is that probably a lot of folks on the call today uh, have a real kind of traditional sense of what remote sensing is. And what we want to bring to bear today are some of the new technologies and new uses. So one of the first folks I'm going to bring on is my colleague Karen Shuckman, who's going to talk a little bit about trends in the remote sensing industry. Then we're going to turn to uh, colleagues of both Karen's and mine, Mike Renslow and Dr. Jay Parrish, who are going to discuss what, how we're addressing some of these new technologies and new trends with three really innovative courses uh, amongst our five innovative curriculum responses to the, the directions of remote sensing. We're going to look at advanced applications of LIDAR, unmanned aerial systems, and then some emerging trends in remote sensing in a seminar format. Karen's going to come back following that and really kind of contextualize the entire Penn State curriculum. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how this is coming to bear in the professions and how we're seeing it. Uh, change certification in remote sensing, again with Mike Renslow. And we've also set aside plenty of time today for questions and answers for you, so we'll get to as many of those as we can. Let's go ahead and turn now to my colleague Karen Shuckman, who's a senior lecturer in the online geospatial education program here at Penn State. Karen was formerly a consultant to the URS Corporation in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and when she was geospatial technology leader there in, in 2005 and 2006, she supported response, recovery, and mitigation projects with FEMA following Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Wilma. She's been past president, or she is past president of the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, former vice chair of NOAA's advisory committee on commercial remote sensing, and is a member of the National Research Council Committees on Floodplain Mapping Technologies and, and FEMA Flood Map Accuracy. 
Karen's a real expert in the field, and I look forward to what she has to say today. Welcome, Karen. Thanks, Wes. And I just want to uh, thank everyone who's participating. It's amazing to see such global participation. And thank Nora and Wes for helping us through the preparation for this. All their guidance was really, really helpful. So when we're talking about remote sensing in the geospatial profession, uh, most people immediately think of imagery that would be either collected from a satellite or some form of an aircraft. Another type of important remote sensing data is elevation or terrain. Historically, elevation data was created using overlapping or stereo imagery using photogrammetry. And this is still being done today using digital aerial cameras and high resolution satellite imagery. Many of you have heard of LIDAR, which is a laser scanning system which effectively paints the ground with 100,000 or more individual elevation measurements every second. LIDAR is currently the preferred method for collecting high resolution and high accuracy elevation data. Radar, or more precisely, Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, or IPSAR, can be used effectively in cloudy or remote areas of the world where aerial photography and LIDAR are difficult to collect. And some of you may have heard of the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, SRTM. SRTM mapped most of the land surface of the Earth at a medium resolution and accuracy. Remote sensing also includes extraction of higher level information from imagery and elevation data. The examples shown here are land cover maps. The one on the upper left was produced for the United States from Landsat data and is given to many users in environmental disciplines. The one on the lower right was produced with a combination of hyperspectral and LIDAR data to identify potential wetlands for environmental permitting of a planned transportation corridor. Here on the upper left, you can see watersheds and streams that have been delineated from elevation data using GIS. This type of product is used in hydrologic studies from water quality to floodplain mapping. On the lower right, you can see radar elevation data creating a textured backdrop for a detailed topographic map. But why is remote sensing important? Many GIS layers originate with remotely sensed data. This is an example of a prototype web-based infrastructure management tool for the Port of Tampa. Remote sensing data, you can see on the left, was used to derive highly detailed, accurately placed 3D buildings tanks, and other port facilities. The 3D buildings were then tied to a database, which can be updated in real time with information about what is stored in each building, who owns it, where it has come from, and where it is going. All of this remote sensing, GIS, and database information is accessible through a web interface for port management and security. Remote sensing is often the fastest way to gain situational awareness as an event unfolds. LIDAR and thermal imagery were flown daily over the World Trade Center site after 9-11 to provide emergency responders with critical information, including the location and volume of debris, and to make temperature measurements across the surface of the disaster site. On the right, this image of tornado damage is worth a thousand map symbols in terms of understanding the conditions on the ground and the extent of devastation. Web applications like Google Earth, MapQuest, and Bing have brought the most basic capabilities of remote sensing into the public consciousness. Because of these tools, many of us can easily merge imagery with terrain, zooming, panning, and even rotating to street level views. But notice in this example from Google Earth that the stadium structure is not accurately represented in the street level view. So at this point, one should be asking some simple questions about this imagery and data. Where did it come from? How current is it? How accurate is it? What information does it actually contain? And how can we appropriately use that information? The answers to these questions are not immediately obvious to the man on the street who can access Google Earth, but every geospatial professional should be able to respond to these questions correctly. For example, what if you were planning security for the London Olympics? In addition to the views provided by Google Earth, you might also want to see the sides of the buildings, the doors and the windows, and so on. 
You might want to measure the height and width of these openings and calculate line of sight from key locations in the facility. So here we can see oblique aerial photography is accurately georeferenced and brought in over the web to ArcGIS using a third-party extension from Pictometry. Or what if you were trying to predict global commodity prices and wanted to know what crop yields are expected this year in Russia? You would want to see large extents of land at medium resolution, perhaps using specific spectral bands to enhance the interpretability of crop status and health. These are views created from Landsat data displayed with different band combinations in ArcGIS. Or if you were interested in the impacts of a new highway, you might need a time series of imagery that has sufficient spatial resolution to see detailed features of both the roadway and the surrounding communities. And as a final example, high resolution imagery, elevation data, and engineering flood studies are brought together to produce digital flood insurance rate maps. DFIRMS are the planning tool used by FEMA and local floodplain managers to guide community development, determine flood insurance premiums, and plan response to future storms. Imagery and terrain provide a view of the world that is so intuitively simple that it's easy to take for granted. This looks like a simple photograph, but it is actually created from a detailed elevation model overlaid with satellite imagery. Imagery and elevation data like these are fundamental components of most GIS projects today. And there are many ways to manipulate, manipulate and analyze these data to meet a specific purpose. But what knowledge and technical skill set do you as a GIS professional need in order to be able to create the right view for your application? In addition, today's geospatial professional needs a lot more than just a basic level of competency in remote sensing to maintain future job security and plan a meaningful career path. Remote sensing technologies and applications are evolving at a lightning pace. And the emerging trends include accessing and analyzing remote sense data from the cloud, interactively manipulating 3D LiDAR points, as Mike Brenslow will discuss in a moment, uh, Dr. Jay Parrish will talk about the use of spectral content outside the visible bands to discover things that can't be seen by the human eye. In addition, many sensors are now being miniaturized and deployed on remotely piloted platforms internationally and domestically. And finally, as with many other forms of GIS data, crowdsourcing of remote sensing will likely become an important form of geospatial intelligence in the future. So with that, I'll pass back to Wes. Thanks, Karen. Uh, and with that useful and yet uh, kind of a hefty load of information there, uh, we, we kind of want to ask the audience to take a deep breath, and we're going to turn to poll number two and ask, how comfortable do you feel with these emerging trends? And, and we'd like you to kind of put yourself somewhere on the scale. So Nora, if you'll turn on poll number two. You bet. Um, folks, do you feel like you're already an expert? You have some exposure, but maybe need more. You know, enough to be dangerous. Or uh, we like to throw a funny one in there. Dude, these trends are freaking me out. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps something else we haven't listed there. So I'll let Nora go ahead and observe the poll and let us know when folks are signing in. Yeah, and you guys are voting quickly. And um, I think that uh, you guys are going to be kind of surprised at the results here. Maybe maybe you'll be surprised or maybe you won't be surprised. Um, I'll be interested to see what people people think. But it looks like the voting is starting to level off again. So I'm just going to give this maybe another five seconds. Um, but uh, we have um, almost all of you have voted. So if you haven't voted yet, please do go ahead and register your vote. And I guess I'll go ahead and uh, close it and share the results. And OK, so 60% of you have exposure but need more. And um, I love that 22% uh, of you know enough to be dangerous. And 11% of you are in the dude, these trends are freaking me out category. <laughs> Um, we got 5% of you who are experts and 4% of you for ha have some other category that applies to you. 
Wes? It sounds like we've got the right audience here today, Nora. That's it? for sure. This is definitely good for, uh, you know, you've dabbled, but you, uh, you need to know more. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hide that one, Wes, and we can go ahead and keep going. Okay. Well, I'm going to introduce Mike Renslow next, and uh, this begins the portion of the presentation today where we're going to look a little deeper into three of the kind of, of technological themes and, and how we at Penn State have addressed those themes with particular um, courses and particular curriculum. So Mike is a senior lecturer here and worked with Karen actually on developing the course specifically on LIDAR. Mike is also a past president of ASPRS, a member of the ISPRS Council, and he happens to be the editor-in-chief for the upcoming ASPRS LIDAR manual to be published in November. So Mike, I look forward to hearing about emerging trends in LIDAR and a little bit about how you take a look at those in your LIDAR course. You know, thanks a lot, Wes, and uh, welcome to everyone that's participating in our, our webinar today. Uh, I'd like to st uh, introduce three emerging technologies that, in my view, are having an impact on remote sensing and the geospatial sciences in general. Uh, the first one of those that I'd like to uh, talk about this morning uh, is full waveform LIDAR. Uh, basically, um, I think everyone knows that LIDAR pulses are columns of electromagnetic energy. Uh, and and there's a waveform of that energy that occurs. And as the diagram on the right-hand side of the figures show, the waveforms easily can be observed as it travels through the vegetation. Um, it's been easier to capture the data. It's been difficult to process the data. Uh, so for that reason, the manufacturers of LiDAR system have provided filters to separate discrete returns, which we're, all of us are pretty familiar with, as you see in the diagram on the, the left-hand side. Well. In the last couple of years, the software has developed, and the processing of these very, very large data sets is now available. And there are some really interesting applications. Uh, the first application uh, that I'd like to introduce to you is being able uh, to use the waveform LIDAR to create very, very, very dense point clouds. In this case, it's of a forest. And visually, you can see the shape of the trees. You can see the understory, if there's a riparian component, and also the bare earth. Uh, so the waveform LIDAR has allowed you to observe all of these. Well, um, with that now, you can do complete mapping and measurement of forest land cover and understory. What does that mean? Well, if you're a forester, it means you can measure height very accurately, and you can compute volume analysis and other kinds of, of measurements in forest land. If you're a biologist, you can also measure and you can map habitat. And if you're a fuels expert, it gives you the data that you need to measure, for example, the live crown and model fire behavior. Another really useful example of full waveform LIDAR is to use um, this technology in identifying airport obstruction surveys. What we have in the figure here is a simulated approach into, into an airport. As you can see in the lower part of the diagram, there is vegetation that is penetrating into the flight path. Well, with full waveform LIDAR, you can identify those obstructions, and also identify very subtle features, features like communication towers and antennas. You know, so full waveform LIDAR is offering us a real opportunity to do some very accurate and complete mapping. Another new technology I'd like to introduce you to is called flash LIDAR. I think everyone's familiar with what a CCD array looks like on a camera. This is basically an array of LIDAR sensors. The figure on the uh, right-hand side shows an array of 127 by 127 LIDAR sensors. Well, what that means, every time this system flashes, you get over 16,000 LIDAR pulses. It can, using one nanosecond pulses, fire at 30 times per second. The simple math will give you nearly half a million pulses per second from a flash LIDAR system. The result is you get a very dense point cloud with LIDAR intensity data. Keep in mind that there are no moving parts. This is quite portable. As the image on the bottom of the diagram shows, they're about as big as a shoebox. And because of the nature of this technology, it can be processed in near real time for development of products for both two-dimensional and three-dimensional uh, spatial data. Uh, this application shows that in a real-time 3D mapping combination of flash LiDAR with a video cam, uh, taking uh, flying in a UAS, uh, capturing 3D stereo imagery with flash LiDAR data, merging it into a three-dimensional visualization. Well, for examples like reconnaissance, change detection, and disaster response, 
this is incredibly useful. Another application is using flash LiDAR to map power line corridors. Um, you know, power line corridors uh, are a very valuable asset to providing power uh, throughout North America and around the world. Um, it's possible with a flash LiDAR system to capture about a thousand miles in a day. That's normal production and be able to very quickly visualize and model and measure terrain, power line height, power line sag, vegetation hazards. Another technology I'd like to introduce you to is mobile mapping systems. During the last two to three years, mobile mapping systems have become very commonplace. Basically, it's capturing geospatial data from a moving vehicle, combining the technologies of LiDAR, imaging systems, frame grabbers and videos, GPS and inertial data, and being able to generate survey quality data quickly and safely. Uh, the image on the top of the, the figure shows a Lynx, a sophisticated system incorporating LiDAR GPS in the video. Uh, the image on the bottom is the Google car with a high performance rotary camera. But basically these systems are designed to provide corridor mapping capability. Well, one application that has become extremely useful for mobile map mapping systems is complex areas, complex corridors. In this case, you're looking at a light rail system. It's quite easy to visualize and measure the tracks, physical conditions, you know, all of the infrastructure, vegetation, signage. It can be done any time of the day, and in this case it was done at night, you know, and the result is a very complete, much more accurate data set than traditional mapping methods. And the last technology I, I'd like to uh, to continue on with this mobile mapping systems is being able to extract engineering measurements. Now what this figure is, it's a pedestrian bridge over a freeway that was recently built in the Portland, Oregon area. And what you can see that was done is the roadway was was driven with a mobile mapping system and from it uh, exact measurements were derived actually to within a hundredth of a foot of the clearance between the road surface and the pedestrian bridge and this is required for safety purposes. I also want to point out that in this case uh, you're not looking at any imagery. What you're looking at is a synthetically colorized point cloud that was made totally from LiDAR. So there was no imagery involved with this. Um, while you're looking at that though and seeing these applications and these new technologies, I'd like to say a few comments about the Penn State uh, curriculum, and I'll focus on the LiDAR course, and Karen alluded to this a little bit also. In the first part of our LiDAR course, we introduce the students to LiDAR. And what's important is in the context of LiDAR, we talk about mapping processes and standards, uh, provide state-of-the-art software, student licenses for all the students, you know, so they can get a good basic understanding of how LiDAR fits into the mapping and the geospatial sciences. The last half of the course, though, focuses on real-world applications, and we've developed a series of lab exercises in addition to reading materials uh, that really focus on practical applications that people will use in their work. So the first one, for example, is the digital elevation module, where we basically introduce the basic techniques of LiDAR data and generation of digital elevation models, but also introduce brake lines and hydroflattening for floodplain management. We then also offer uh, a segment on forestry mapping where you can actually measure trees and do an estimation of biomass. We offer another module on mobile mapping systems so that the students could, can actually visualize and work with mobile mapping data. These are good examples in these application sections as to what the practitioners are really doing in the real world um, with, with LiDAR data. With that, um, we'll turn it back to Wes. Thanks a lot, Mike. I appreciate hearing about the LiDAR course, and we're going to hear about a couple more courses as well. I would like to welcome Dr. Jay Parrish to the webinar, professor of practice here in the online geospatial education program. Prior to coming to Penn State, uh, Jay was the state geologist for Pennsylvania and director of the Pennsylvania Bureau of Topographic and Geological Survey for over nine years. Uh, he's a National Geospatial Advisory Committee member currently a member of the National Digital Elevation Program, has his PhD in geophysics, actually from Penn State as well, and has a particular interest in geobotanical remote sensing. Jay, welcome. 
Well, thank you very much, Wes. It's glad to be here. Uh, let me tell you about two courses that we are offering. Uh, the first is the Geo UAS course, uh, which is involves unmanned aerial systems. You may have referred to them, further referred to as UASs, UAVs, or drones. Uh, it's it, 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 uh, it's obviously going to be a very large industry in the near future, in the billions of dollars. Uh, the FAA is ruling on what the usage will be and what kind of uh, uh, policies will be in place for the usage in the next few years. And uh, these things can range in size from something in your hand to something really large, and from something you know, hundred, hundreds of dollars to tens of millions of dollars. The types can um, be fixed wing, blimps, uh, nanocopters, uh, octocopters, you know, any variety of those things. And the applications are uh, that they can go where humans can't. They can go into small spaces. Uh, where there's natural disasters, uh, toxic environments, uh, places are just not possible to fly. And they're also good for small areas. It wouldn't be cost effective to fly with a fixed wing plane, perhaps. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the yeah, ethics and legal issues involved with this, uh, airspace access, privacy, data sharing, uh, exactly who has access to the data, who has the right to fly around and, and work around with uh, these very small systems, uh, or even the very large ones. One of the class activities will be doing is a flight simulator of a UAS. Uh, we'll be able to take off, fly a, a mission, and come back and look at the imagery we're collecting, all done digitally in a virtual sense. And we'll be working on a class model for proposed rules for usage since, since the rules have not yet been published. It might be interesting for us to say, well, what would we do if we had that option? <clears throat> One of the other things we'll be looking at is the uh, emerging trends in remote sensing. Um, there's two books that we're using that because it, it's a slightly different course. We learn how to think about image interpretation and processing, uh, not just out of doing it. And the two books are, one is The Slice of Mind, which is on the neuro, uh, neuroscience of magic. The other is uh, La Bella Principessa, which is about a uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, talk drawing. So we're applying some of the things we learn in that into uh, remote sensing and image processing. But we'll do traditional things as well. For instance, we'll do thermal imagery, uh, looking at astro data in Death Valley, for doing geologic mapping using ratio bands, uh, multipolarization with radar, and land cover mapping, which allows you to look at uh, orientation of trees and moisture and texture and a lot of other kinds of information you wouldn't otherwise be able to obtain. We'll look at some of the issues of ethics, uh, the Satellite Sentinel project. Um, using data to predict where violence may occur, and then we're talking about the responsibility to warn versus just to inform, and what kind of ethical considerations are there with that. We'll also be looking at the Jingu River in Brazil with an environmental problem there. Turning to the art part, um, let's take an example of a Rembrandt, Rembrandt uh, self-portrait that's in Washington, D.C. As you can see, <clears throat> he put a lot of effort and time into the face where we naturally look when we look at people who look in their eyes. And if you look down at his hands, he really just sort of swapped them on there. And that's because we use high resolution pixels in the center of our vision, and our peripheral vision uses low resolution pixels. So just as we do when we look at an, at an image, we interpret things and fill in the detail around that, um, assuming that the low resolution imagery is the same as the high resolution imagery. It's kind of like what a pickpocket does with you. They just direct you and, and let you interpret and fill in the detail where there isn't really actual detail there. That all holds true when we look at imagery and when we look at uh, any kind of any kind of processing that we're doing. So turning to La Bella Principessa, which is a, a drawing that was uh, bought for about $20,000 is now valued at about $100 million because it's a da Vinci. Um, and you would say, well, how do we know that? There's a number of the book details, you know, the process they went through to try to authenticate it. But one of the routes they took was multispectral examination of it. And you can get the spectra of all the pixels um, that make up each uh, part of the drawing. You can see whether it's chalk or charcoal or ink or what part of it went into it. And that's really analogous to looking at hyperspectral imagery. So you, you can look at the hyperspectral imagery of the ground, or you can look at the hyperspectral imagery of a a painting. It's the same idea, the same processes. And the idea is that we want to learn how to do it and not be focused on the geography so much that we lose track of the uh, 
what exactly we're doing to the data. And so if you learn the techniques on data that isn't something that's well known to you, then perhaps you can uh, focus more on the technique you're do using than on the geography. Going on to the, uh, the other uh, geographic <laughs> application we have is looking at the LaFont map of Washington, D.C. Um, and that is uh, a map that is famous because it was created by you know, the guy who laid out D.C., LaFont, and Washington and Jefferson got to write on it. They, they put annotations on it in pencil. And so what we do with it is uh, analyze it as best we can with all the information we can pull out of it. So one of the things we do is look at the filtering out things in it. If you look at the, the grain of the paper, you can filter out regular uh, noise by transforming it into the wave number domain and then inverse transforming back into the uh, spatial domain. Uh, and, and while you're in the wave number domain, you can filter out regular noise. And you can bring out things like watermarks. Or uh, you may notice that there's kind of two tones of orange here. Uh, one is the clouds. Um, it means it's an example could be used like a cloud. And what I'm saying is that the, the glue that was painted on the map actually uh, obscures part of the map. And it's analogous to a, to a cloud. Uh, and likewise, you can look at enhancing pencil marks, or you can look at the texture, as I said before. All these things can be applied both to the map and to imagery in the real world. So with that, I'm going to return it to Wes. Thanks, Jay. And that's a really interesting spin on, on how we might use some aspatial techniques to better improve our spatial skills. I want to return to Karen, who got us started. Uh, we, we've looked at three specific courses, but Karen is going to come back and give us really an overview of the entire curriculum and how these courses fit together. So Karen, welcome back. Thanks, Wes. Well, here at Penn State, we saw the need to develop a core curriculum in remote sensing to supplement our existing GIS offerings. So we based this remote sensing curriculum on two important documents. The first is the Geospatial Technology Competency Model, developed by the Department of Labor to address workforce needs in the geospatial profession. The second is the Geospatial Analyst Competency Plan authored by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. We try to address the basic industry-wide technical competencies at the introductory level, analysis and modeling at the intermediate level, and emerging trends in our two graduate seminar courses. My personal mission and the reason I left industry to teach is to make sure that all geospatial professionals have some basic competency in the use of imagery and elevation data. My experience is that a lot of people know almost enough to be dangerous, but they often run into trouble uh, with some fairly simple problems, um, often re uh, involving you know, either georeferencing, um, the size of the data sets themselves, understanding error and accuracy, and so on. So at the introductory level, we focus on imagery and elevation data base maps with hands-on exploration of display and analysis capabilities that are available in ArcGIS. At the intermediate level, we have two in-depth courses. The first covers image analysis, focusing on multispectral imagery in applications such as land cover and vegetation mapping. The second covers LIDAR in detail. Mike has talked about that, including sensor and platform design, processing LiDAR data, and using it in applications. In these two courses, students get a lot of hands-on experience with a number of commercial software packages, including PCI Geomatica, Pictometry, Envy, LP360, Quick Terrain Modeler, and Mars. Our approach to teaching is to combine the theoretical knowledge with the hands-on experience that's critical for students when they're seeking employment. These software packages that we use are state-of-the-art in industry, and we have worked in industry ourselves, uh, have trained people in the workforce, understand what the needs are, and so we've designed the courses specifically to make sure that our students get that kind of valuable experience. 
Finally, Dr. Parrish offers two graduate level seminars covering more advanced image analysis and, as you heard, unmanned aerial systems. And he's talked about the seminar content in his presentation. You can find more information about our courses on the World Campus Remote Sensing webpage. We'll be showing you that URL in a few moments. Okay, Karen, thanks a lot. Well, we, we've given you a lot of information, and uh, we, we always try to do that in these webinars. We hope it's the opening of a conversation with folks that are interested in, in curricular offerings we have here at Penn State. Um, I'd like to turn, though, now to poll number three. And, and just ask the audience, so based on what you've learned today, what do you think you need to do next? And, and please just choose one here. We'll have Nora go ahead and open the poll up. So is the next step for you to complete some kind of certificate or track in remote sensing? Maybe just take a course in remote sensing, perhaps introductory or intermediate, depending upon your level. Um, dabble a bit on your own, do some research. Or EGADS, I don't even know what to do, or, or something else. Let's go ahead and take a minute, and Nora, keep me abreast of how yeah. the polls are coming. Yeah, we're actually getting extremely um, strong activity on the poll um, and on all and on all of the polls that we've had today. So um, definitely asking the right questions. Um, and I do have questions coming in as well on the question interface, so please do feel free to keep um, those coming in. We will try to get to as many of those as we can. And, oh my gosh, um, just again, almost everybody in the audience is voting on these. Um, so I'll just give another two or three seconds. So if you haven't voted and would like to vote, please go ahead and do so. And, um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and close it. And I'll share the results. And, um, you know, a lot of people who want to take, a, a quarter of you want to take a certificate, 30% of you would like to take a course, a um, quarter of you are willing to strike out on your own, and we have that 6% who's in the EGADS mode, um, and 16% uh, describe themselves uh, in some other, um, being in some other mode, but um, what do you think, Wes? Well, I'd like to turn to one more topic before we get to folks' questions, and I think I think we'll have some thoughts on what folks should do next, as well as I, I know some of the questions we've been getting as I've been watching the question groups are on uh, on the trends themselves. So we'll get to those in just a minute. Before we do, though, I want to turn to Mike Renslow one more time. Um, one of the things that we really want to cover, we always want to make these webinars, uh, you know, really kind of practically focused, and so we know folks are concerned about uh, their, their place in the workforce and, and are they prepared and are they competitive. And so Mike's going to speak to us for just a minute about certification in remote sensing and how that can be advantageous to your career. So welcome back, Mike. Hey, Wes, thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to just share with you a few comments about uh, professional development and certification in the geospatial sciences. One question you may have right at the beginning is, why do I need to become certified? Well, basically, certification and being certified is an opportunity to stand out from the rest of the folks in our field. The geospatial workforce is growing all around the world. And anything that you can do with your education or your training or your experience is important towards your career and your professional development. So I'd like to share with you a few comments about some of the existing certification programs that exist. The first one I'd like to mention is the certification program available from the American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. I'm pretty close to this program because I chair the committee for the society. But frankly, it's an old DER program. It's been around over 35 years. It initially began to certify folks that practiced in photogrammetry, but has matured to the, to the point now where it also provides a certification for both folks who specialize in remote sensing and our GIS practitioners. The certification program is developed for folks at both the professional level and the technologist level. And it's a time-proven process that includes peer review, personal references, and an examination. And, and one thing I wanted to spend a few extra moments about was talking about a special program that the society has developed for graduating students. It's possible that you've completed your education and you want to become certified, but you need the required job experience. It is possible through the provisional certification program to go through the complete process without yet having the experience 
and becoming provisionally certified. And when your experience is completed, then you become fully certified. And of course, if you participate in the, in the curriculum and the coursework at Penn State, you certainly can qualify with this program. There are a few other programs I'd like to share some comments with you. Many of you are familiar, perhaps, with the GIS Certification Institute, who developed professional certification that was implemented in 2004. And today, there's approximately 5,000 professionally certified uh, they're certified by GSCI. It's based on peer review and it's examination of your education, your experience, and your contributions to the profession. Another one that is becoming quite an interesting certification process is the U.S. Geospatial Intelligence Foundation. This basically is a review of the college course geointelligence curriculum and program and providing an accreditation. Penn State is one of a small group of universities that has the accreditation and possesses the certificate from USGIF. Uh, so when students graduate from the program, they receive a certificate from Penn State and also a certificate from USGIS. And this program is expanding. And the, the staff at Penn State and the faculty are very aware of this. And uh, we are very much involved with the process. Uh, and finally, uh, the University Consortium on USGIS uh, has de developing a program to assist higher learning institutions uh, to develop a, a certification based on degree and non-degree training programs. And with that, I'll turn it back to Wes. Thanks, Mike. I'll take just a minute to put some additional resources up. Uh, if, if anything, you might copy down that URL at the top of the page www.worldcampus.psu.edu slash rs and that'll get you directly to a landing page with the remote sensing curriculum and some of the specific issues we've covered today. We've also got the emails for our, our three faculty that have presented today. promise you that in the follow-up email that Nora will send tomorrow we'll have all this contact information along with the link to the website, uh, to the archive of the, of the webinar today. Um, but what we'd really like to do now is, is turn to your questions, and I know they've been coming in. I'm going to go ahead and field the first question while we get some of the others queued up. One person asks, uh, do you have an online undergrad program for GIS? I am sorry to say we currently do not offer an online undergrad program for GIS. The courses that we talk about today and in many of our webinar series offerings have to, uh, are primarily targeted towards folks that are post-baccalaureate, so after a bachelor's degree. I will say this, though. Many of our courses have been developed, and certainly some of the remote sensing courses fall into this category. Uh, we, we like to think of them as professional development. And professional development really means different things to different people. So some folks just want to go out and learn the content, um, and some folks want to advance in a particular uh, vein of the industry. And so if you have an interest in, in one of the courses we've talked about today, or really most of the courses in Penn State's online geospatial education program, please don't hesitate to contact us, and we'll see if we can't find the right match for you. I know that we had a question early on, and I'm going to try to pull that one up here. Um, and this one I'm going to turn, to, I think, to Karen first, and then to, and, and perhaps Jay wants to comment as well. So the first question is, is hyperspectral imaging an expanding science or declining? And what they mean by that is, is it being replaced by other less expensive technologies that are just as good? Karen, do you want to take that first? Yeah, I would say it's definitely um, on the upswing. Uh, hyperspectral remote sensing has been around for some time, but the sensors were, uh, they're few in number, um, rather expensive, and the data is quite complex in its content and difficult to process. Um, we've got much more uh, capability to do that data processing on the desktop now with many different software packages. And so I would expect to see um, more use of hyperspectral data going forward as, as more people begin to understand how to make use of that, again, very uh, complex data set. Jay, anything you'd like to add to that comment? Did we lose Jay? I don't know. It looks like he might have lost audio temporarily. I'll, I'll see if we can get him back, um, okay. Wes. 
let, let's go ahead and move on to another question. Um, Mike, I think I'm going to turn to you first on this one, and perhaps Karen wants to comment as well. This one has to do with LIDAR, and the question asks, has any mobile LIDAR mapping been used or developed for riparian areas and coastal communities? Um, well, uh, as far as the riparian component, um, there has been a couple of studies um, and they're documented in the literature where uh, mobile mapping systems and also static LIDAR systems have been used in the forestry environment uh, to create profiles. And so the answer to that is yes, although not very much. Um, now, on the other issue, though, of the coastal areas, mobile mapping systems are used quite extensively, uh, at least in my experience, on both coasts of the United States. Um, they are extremely useful uh, for doing, like, sand dune mapping, for example, um, and on the East Coast, especially where they have um, you know, major weather events for mapping change detection. Uh, on the West Coast, um, where I am, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the erosion factors on the West Coast are, are really infringing upon a lot of urban development. And so uh, there is a very active program. Uh, it may be through the state uh, mapping department or the, uh, the state geology department on being able to uh, use mobile mapping systems uh, for mapping uh, the, uh, the structure and the erosion factor and change detection and also taking remediative action. You know, so, yeah, the answer is yes to that. I, I, if I recall, one of the first uh, kind of publicly uh, disseminated studies or, or examples was North Carolina. The state of North Carolina did a whole lot of coastal mapping with LIDAR. I, I seem to find that whenever I do a search on LIDAR. But, Karen, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, um, I'll go back to the North Carolina example. Um, it, indeed, it, uh, it was one of the first big applications of airborne LIDAR, but they have uh, gone ahead and collect, used mobile mapping, vehicle-based mobile mapping, quite extensively to map all of the coastal roadways to help more accurately predict inundation due to storm surge in the event of a hurricane and to plan evacuation. Um, so it's not really an um, environmental application, but more of a transportation emergency response application. But as with what, as is always true with remote sensing, once that data is collected, you can be sure that many people are going to find other applications for it than what was originally intended for the collection. Yeah, I, I think you're definitely right there, and I, I mean, just to kind of from my own experience, you know, I think most of the folks on the call know that that I kind of focus more on the kind of the business and and marketing and demographic aspects of of GIS. And one thing that I see now more and more is, you know, we, we used to joke in commercial real estate about going out and kicking the dirt, and we kind of have this joke about scanning the dirt now because there's really so much you can do in terms of looking at at site selection and site pads and that kind of thing. Um, you know, in, in terms of remotely sensed data, I, I always argue that there's nothing quite like walking, walking a parking lot to get a sense of a store site, but you see this again and again and again. So I think you're right. I think what happens is there's an application and then, and then we multitask the data back again and, and the commercial applications are really taking off. Um, let's see. This one asks, and I'm not sure who to point this to, maybe start with Mike. Um, are there solutions for mobile mapping for the interior of buildings, such as street view to tour interior office properties? The answer is yes. <laughs> There's actually, um, you know, there are several documented applications now of using static LIDAR systems to inventory the insides of buildings. Um, and there's actually a, uh, a firm that, uh, called Urban Robotics that I'm familiar with uh, that has developed a, an emerging technology with a sensor that actually can um, you know, develop, a, as we would call it, a flight path. It can develop kind of a transportation path through a building and it can, you know, because the, the develop a 3D model of, of the building and the vehicle can travel through the building and go into the individual, I don't think it can open the doors yet, but it can go through the individual rooms and actually create a three-dimensional model of everything there is in that room using imagery and a LIDAR system. So, yeah, having that, uh, that total GIS um, 
for the insides of structures, you know, has historically been a pretty difficult uh, process. And of course, you know, to do it manually is almost cost prohibitive. But uh, that technology is is uh, is coming. Yeah, the answer is yes. Well, and we can almost even imagine uh, in this era of moving into big data and, and real-time sensing, you can imagine lidar, you know, flash lidar being used inside of a warehouse, for instance track the positioning of, of, you know, certain inventories or whatever. So almost, you know, the, the converse of what Karen was showing us early on. Um, I would like to turn, because we've got some real specific questions about courses, and I'd like to take a few moments to hit a couple of those if we can. So one of the questions, and I touched on this already, but I'll, I'll turn to Karen with this one. Um, is it possible to take individual courses such as LIDAR online without taking the entire certificate? Well, the answer to that is definitely yes. In fact, the LIDAR course was one of the first courses that we um, developed with the intention of people being able to take it uh, as a single educational experience. Um, I do encourage students to uh, look at the course website, which is pennstatelidar.com, and look, you can see a lot of the course content there. It's publicly available. Uh, we have a little self-assessment quiz that we ask people to take because there is the assumption if you take this course that you're, um, you're fairly familiar with a lot of basic geospatial concepts um, and you have some capabilities, particularly with ArcGIS. So I would okay. tell people, look at that website and look also at the website for the intro course to see kind of where your level of expertise and preparation is. Thank you, Karen. I, I, um, I'm going to take this next question. Uh, this is a, a more advanced education question. So one person asks, I have a bachelor's in geography, but often think of returning for a master's in GIS or remote sensing. Which would be more beneficial? And I'm actually not sure if there's a master's of remote sensing out there, but Karen, maybe you and Mike, and I don't know if, if we've got Jay back, if, if you guys want to take a moment and kind of characterize advanced education in remote sensing as it relates to GIS. Uh, let's start with Karen. I, mean, I think the, I mean, the answer to the question really has a lot to do with what this person's uh, personal goals are. Um, I would say, I would say incorporating remote sensing, having a, uh, courses in remote sensing in conjunction with a larger ge geospatial program like a Masters of GIS um, would be advantageous. Um, I think that it's important to see remote sensing in, a, in the greater geospatial context and so that having um, other kinds of courses that relate to project management, um, different kinds of uh, spatial analysis, complemented by a strong curriculum in remote sensing would really uh, be beneficial. I think some of the typical, uh, historically, the more typical masters in remote sensing is very focused on um, a, a very higher level but more specific um, application, more scientific applications of image analysis, for example. Yeah, we got Jay back. Jay, do you want to pick up on that notion of a masters in remote sensing? Well, um Actually, I'm biased, but I, I've always enjoyed remote sensing, and I think you know it's the basis for GIS. I mean, most of the data that you use in GIS starts out as some kind of imagery data, but it's a fascinating field, and so it, it really depends upon what you want to do and, and what, what excites you. I'm, I'm personally thrilled by, by imagery, and so for me, it's a no-brainer to say, oh, I'd rather people went into Masters of Remote Sensing. But, um, it has the potential to to grow and and uh, technology change, and it's a, a very large field that's just constantly, you know, coming up with new things. And so, I think from that point of view, it's an exciting area to go. Thanks, thanks a lot. I, and I think we've got a couple of kind of, uh, you know, corollary but but slightly different positions there, and that's that's interesting. So, I you know, I guess what I would add to that is talk to some programs and find out what they say. You know, contact faculty in given master's programs and, and have a conversation. Many faculty are actually quite happy to have a conversation with prospective students. Um, this one's a little I'd different also, question. Oh, just go ahead. Yeah. I would also encourage people to look at the ASPRS, uh, the remote sensing industry forecast that you can find on the ASPRS website because 
This is an extensive study that's been going on for quite a number of years now and outlining what the potential growth areas are and what the workforce development needs are related to remote sensing. So that's a very good resource for people to check out. And we did include that in the invite, but we'll, I'll ask Nora to go ahead and include that in the thank you note that we follow up with. I want to get to at least one more question, and then I think folks will start to drop off here because we're at the top of the hour, uh, and I'll let Nora let us know if we can continue with a couple more questions since we've got so many. Um, yeah, one absolutely. person asked, how can I refresh my education in GIS and remote sensing without taking full courses? Anybody have an answer to that? I well, guess I would, a lot of again, again remind people that, about that. Oh, let, let's get Mike. Sorry, Mike. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I, I just, there, there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, you're attending a webinar right now, which gives you kind of an, an overview of, of some of the things going on in the field of remote sensing and geospatial sciences. But, you know, the professional associations offer some excellent meetings and workshops. Some of those are actually offered in, in a web format also. You know, so um, admittedly, a lot of folks just can't make the time to take a course, so they have to be constantly doing something. But you can time your schedule in such a way that you can attend a lot of these workshops or take webinars. And, you know, at least the, I'm very familiar with the ASPRS webinar program, and it, it offers state-of-the-art state education uh, for geospatial sciences. So I, I would recommend that they take a look at those opportunities. Nora, did I get to go ahead from you that we could go for another couple minutes? And hand yeah, it? definitely. Go for it. Okay. I, I, I feel like we've got about 170 people still hanging on with us yeah. and a lot of questions. So uh, for those of you that need to hop off, I, I want to say thank you on behalf of Penn State and, and on behalf of Nora and Directions Media. And then uh, for those of you that didn't get your question answered, we'll try to get to a couple more here uh, before we close out the webinar today. Um, there, there's one that I'm dying to get to, and I think we'll start with Jay on this one. Um, and that is, can any of the speakers comment on the public's concerns with privacy and how we might allay their fears as we use this technology for the public's benefit. And Jay, I know you're kind of engaging with that notion in one of your courses. What, what's your thinking there? Well, it's a great question. Um, we, we definitely have a, a tremendous increase in the capability to invade your privacy. And uh, how we make use of that data is really um, something that comes back to both a policy issue and a technical issue, but it, you as a person who's involved in this as a student or a professional um, are involved in that whole mix. And it can be, you know, there's several ways to look at it. I think one of the more interesting solutions I saw was that if you have a lot of uh, UA, UASs flying around your neighborhood and you're concerned about people invading your privacy, what if the rule were that all data collected from a UAS were public? so that essentially everybody knew who was looking and what they were looking at. And there was nobody who had information that wasn't secret, things that was secret anyway. But it was always completely free and out there. And that's an intriguing uh, possibility to me, because I think that total transparency might alleviate some of that um, concern that people have about privacy. There are many things that we in the past would have said, oh, that would be an invasion of privacy, but over time we've, technology has made it such that we, we readily accept it. For one thing, we, we have your photos of our backyard now, and nobody thinks anything of it. But not too long ago, people were outraged that there were air photos. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Mike, do you want to say anything in that regard? Yeah, I guess I can only agree with what Jay said. You know, it's true. Um, you know, 10 years ago, having, you know, uh, one-fourth of a foot image resolution of the city you live in would have caused a lot of, a lot of concern among people about privacy issues, but today it's normal. And, you know, there, even though most of the world doesn't realize that they're using remote sensing, uh, they are. I mean, they have all sorts of devices, you know, that allow them to uh, observe and in some cases even manage the data to extract different kinds of information. And, it, you know, they, they use it all the time, you know. So um, I, I do think, though, um, uh, in, in, in the larger picture, you know, uh, even though the data is available, um, you know, it's how, it, how the data gets used is where it starts to become, you know, uh, an issue with, with privacy. So um, I, think, I think the 
I think in general the public has, has accepted the fact that we live in a world where there's a, a lot of information available. Yeah. Um, Karen, I'd like to turn to you for a, a different question, and uh, maybe we'll do this one and one more, and then I think we, we don't want to take up too much of folks' time, but I, I thought this was a good one, and it kind of touches back on the, the software that you discussed that some of the courses engage the students with. So this question reads, do you know of any educational institutions or software companies, example, um, and I'm not going to get this right, Excelistiz or Envy, um, that offer on-the-job training? I want to continue my learning. My employer is willing to support further remote sensing exploration. Uh, should they take a course with us, or should they go for the on-the-job training, or how does this work? Um, again, I think it's it kind of depends on the person's personal situation. Um, a lot of the software manufacturers offer kind of, you know training webinars and so on, and I for one also make use of those just to keep myself current with software such as Envy and so on. I think the difference between taking um, the vendor training and taking a course like the ones we offer, we tend to give a, a, a quite a bit more sort of theoretical background in sort of, you know, how does this work? And how does how do the sensors work? What is the software actually doing? Where the software training that you get from the vendor is usually more about like some people call it, you know, learning the buttonology, like which buttons do I press and where are the tools. But I think they don't always have time uh, to go into you know, the, the background about what is actually happening. So in our courses, we try to use the software as a means of demonstrating principles and concepts, not just giving software training. I, I think that's a fair answer, and I, I, I can speak from, you know, other courses in the program. I think that's, you know, students who graduate from the Penn State program or take courses with us certainly feel that way. Um, maybe this we can make our last question unless anybody has anything else they want to say. Mike, um, I think I'll give this one to you. I think it's a pretty easy one. We'll see. Um, folks want to know, would certification be recognized throughout the world or only for the U.S.? Um, well, the I AS think we're talking about the, like the ASPRS and that. Yeah, kind the of ASPRS thing. program is an international program. Um, we actually have, I, I just looked at this, the statistics recently, and we have about 80 individuals that are certified outside the United States and Canada. Um, and, you know, the, a membership in ASPRS is not required, you know, to be certified. You know, so the answer is yes, yeah, an international program. Well, thanks, and I, I don't want to take up too much of folks' time. I appreciate those of you. We still got 133 in the audience hanging on with us. Um, really, really robust discussion today, and a lot of great questions answered. Do Do any of our panelists have any last things they want to say before I say thank you and hand it back to Nora? I think that's a no. Okay. <laughs> well, on behalf of, of Penn State and this wonderful eighth episode in, in the Inside Geospatial Education and Research series, I'm really glad you joined us today. Nora, thanks from Penn State to Directions Media, and please take us out. Yeah, thank you so much, and thanks to the speakers. Thanks for everybody who joined up. Um, I wanted to mention to the audience, you know, we did have a lot of questions. We didn't even scratch the surface, but our um, panelists did put their emails up there, and they put them up there. I double-checked with them. They really do want you to uh, to interact with them, and um, so please do um, do follow up on questions that didn't get um, answered. And um, anyway, so yeah, let's let's go ahead and wrap up, Wes, since we did take a little bit of extra time. So thanks again, everybody, for coming. And be sure to tell a friend about Directions Magazine, and we'll see you the next time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>